Hello dear students, I am Dr. Moinuddin. In this video we are going to discuss about fluorescent spectroscopy. In my previous videos, we have discussed about fluorescence and phosphorescence. So we have seen the definition, their basic principle. Then we have seen the Jablonski diagram. So if you didn't watch my previous videos, then you must watch them. I will share their link in the description. So here are the contents of current video. We will see about the Stokes shift. Then we will see about fluorescent spectra. We will see the definition of mirror image rule. Then we will see what is Frank Condon principle. And in the end we will see what is fluorescent quenching. So first of all, we will see the Stokes shift. Dear students, here is the spectra you can see on the left, uh, below left side. And this is the fluorescent spectra of pyrilene in benzene. And you can see, actually there are two spectra. One is shown in blue while other is in red. This blue one indicates the absorption spectra while the red one shows the emission spectra. So what can we conclude from this spectra that actually the absorption phenomena that actually occurs generally in UV, UV region. And when the molecule excites, so definitely it will emit radiations and there is the phenomena of fluorescence. And these emission radiations, their wavelength fall generally in the visible region. So we can say uh, both of these spectra appear at different places and this is actually caused the Stokes shift. Now we will see what is the reason behind why emission spectra is uh, at the longer side than absorption spectra. So there is Jablonski diagram on the right side you can see and when we examine the Jablonski diagram it reveals that the energy of the emission is typically less than that of absorption. You can clearly see when the electrons are in ground state, so they absorb radiation and they move towards the higher state, Sn, which is shown over here. And there are several, several relaxation. And then from the lowest vibrational level, there, there occurs the phenomena of fluorescence. So definitely energy is decreased. So when energy is decreased, so this is the reason that we get the emission spectra towards the longer wavelength sides. This phenomena was first observed by Sir G. G. Stokes in 1852 at the University of Cambridge. Stokes performed his experiments in a church and the instrumentation used in his experimentation was quite simple. So you can see it in a diagram which is on left side. So source of ultraviolet radiation was sun. Sunlight was used as a source of UV radiation. Then this sunlight was passed through a, 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 a glass window which acted, which acted as glass filter. Means it allowed to pass through it only UV light with wavelength less than 400 nanometer. Then this UV light was made to fall on a quinine solution. And then transmitted light was made to pass through another glass and this time he used a yellow glass of wine and it also acted as a filter and this time this filter acted that it only allowed to pass the radiations with wavelength greater, greater than 400 nanometer. And in this way, the quinine solution which was appearing to him as colorless that appeared as blue in color means fluorescence was occurred there at the wavelength of around 450 nanometer and that can be seen on the right diagram. Now we will try to understand this phenomena with the help of Jablonski diagram. So energy losses 
between excitation and emission are observed universally for fluorescent molecules in solution. One common cause of Stokes shift is the rapid decay of the lowest vibrational level of S1. What does it what does this mean? Whenever electron gets energy, UV radiation, it is excited to higher energy level. It may go to S1, may go to S2 and so on. So there will be several relaxations and this electron will try to get back to S1. This is also the excited level. So electron will try to get back to S1 and also towards the lowest vibrational level of S1. And then another thing, when it, when it will get back from S1 to S0, so it doesn't get back to the lowest vibrational level of S0. It gets back to some higher level of S0 and this results in fluorescence. And what happens there? Actually, energy is decreased. And when energy is decreased, so the emission spectra, definitely that will be observed towards longer side in visible region. There may be also some other reasons. Fluorophores, the fluorescence active compounds, they are called fluorophores. They can display further stroke, sh stroke shifts and there may be some solvent effects. There could be some excited state reactions. There might be some complex formation or there might be some energy transfer by which uh, uh, this uh, stroke sh shift is, what do you say, observed. So emission spectra are typically independent of the excitation wavelength. What we are going to see in this slide actually. Suppose in the first experiment, we irradiate a molecule by ultraviolet radiation this may cause the excitation of electron from S0 to S1. In next experiment, there might be chances that it may excite from S0 to S2. So definitely energy is, uh, there is energy difference. So wavelength will be changed. So this is what do you, what do you say that excitation wavelength may change. But fluorescence, it occurs, it generally occurs from S1, from the lowest vibrational level of S1. So that is why emission spectra does not change. So another property is that the same fluorescence emission spectrum is generally observed irrespective of the excitation wavelength as I explained. And this is also known as Kasha's rule. Upon excitation into higher electronic and vibrational level, the excess energy is quickly dissipated, leaving the fluorophore in the lowest vibrational level of S1. So suppose it goes to the highest vibrational level of S1, so soon there will be relaxation and it will come back to the lowest vibrational level of S1. And this relaxation occur in about 10 raised minus 12 second, in a very short time. Because of this rapid relaxation, Emission spectra are usually independent of the excitation wavelength. But there are some ex exceptions as well. For example, there might be some fluorophores that exist in two ionization states, two different states. Each of which definitely they will display distinct absorption and emission spectra. So both of these ionization states, they will have different spectra. So in this case, the spectra may vary. Another exception, some molecules are known to emit from the S2 level. Some, mole some molecules may show fluorescence phenomena from S2 level. But such emissions are rare and generally not observed in biological molecules. So these are some rare exceptions. Now we will see the mirror image rule. We have seen earlier the fluorescence spectra and we know that there are actually two spectra. 
one is absorption spectra while other is emission spectra if we see the fluorescence spectra carefully we can see that both of these two spectra actually they are mirror image to each other you can see here is also another spectra so let's see what happens actually symmetric nature of fluorescence spectra is a result of the same transitions being involved in both absorption and emission so why they are mirror image to each other actually the transition in both absorption and emission they are same and the similar vibrational energy levels of S0 and S1 so the transition happen, happen from S0 to S1 or S1 to S, S0 so that is why most of the time the spectra are mirror image to each other in most fluorophores these energy levels are not significantly altered by the different electronic distributions of S0 and S1 okay so absorption and emission spectrum of anthracene is shown here on the left side you can see and here are different transitions which are shown over here and you can see uh, uh, three transitions are actually uh, uh, being discussed here if we talk about the absorption spectrum so first transition that is shown in the blue uh, with blue arrow so you can see in the right side this transition that is going from S0 to the highest vibrational level of S1 then the second band that is due to uh, the transition from S0 to the uh, second uh, lower level of S1 and third one is from S0 to the lowest vibrational level of S1 so due to energy difference as the energy energy is decreasing so definitely wavelength of absorption is increasing so we are getting three peaks in absorption spectra and now if we talk about the emission then again there are three emissions from these energy levels these vibrational levels one is coming from the lowest vibrational level shown in the blue arrow other in the what do you say uh, first vibrational level of S0 and the third one is the second vibrational level of S0 and this will give us the excitation spectra and you can see uh, low is the energy and peak will be appeared towards the longest side so because the energy gaps in these excitation and emission because they correlate with each other they are similar to each other that is why both of these spectra for most of the time they are mirror image to each other now we'll see the Frank Condon principle according to Frank Condon principle all electronic transitions are vertical as we have seen in the previous slide that is they occur without change in the position of the nuclei then as a result if a particular transition probability that is also known as Frank Condon factor it is going to happen between zeroth and first vibrational level is largest in absorption means if its probability is largest is high then the reciprocal transition means from excitation to ground state that is also most probable that is we are talking about emission this is a Frank Condon principle now we will see the fluorescence quenching what is the fluorescence quenching the intensity of fluorescence can be decreased by a wide variety of processes so there are a large number of processes by which the intensity of fluorescence can be decreased and this decrease in intensity this is actually is called quenching so it occurs by different mechanisms and one of them is coll collisional quenching it occurs when the excited state fluorophore is deactivated upon contact with some other molecules in solution means in excited state some other molecule deactivate this molecule this is called collig collisional quenching and that other molecule that is called quencher in this case the fluorophore is returned to the ground state 
during its diffusive encounter with the quencher. But the molecule, there is no chemical change in the molecule in the fluorophore. A wide variety of molecules can act as collisional quenchers, for example, oxygen, halogens, amines, and electron deficient molecules like acrylamide. The mechanism of quenching varies with the fluorophore quencher pair. So it varies from pair to pair. For instance, for example, quenching of indole by acrylamide is probably due to electron transfer from indole to acrylamide which does not occur in the ground state. Then quenching by halogen and heavy atoms occur due to spin orbit coupling and inter-system crossing, crossing which change their state from singlet state to triplet state. So definitely there will be no fluorescence. Other types of quenching so in which fluorophores can also form non-fluorescent complexes with quenchers. This process is referred to as static quenching since it occurs in the ground state. And then quenching can also occur by a variety of trivial that is non-molecular mechanism such as attenuation of the incident light means in which there is a reduction of the incident light by the fluorophore or there are some species in the environment which start absorbing that this light and fluorophore cannot show absorption. So there could be the quenching. So this is all about the basics of fluorescence and phosphorescence. Thanks for watching. If you like my video then like it and if you didn't subscribe my channel yet then subscribe it to get in touch with my upcoming interesting videos. Thank you very much.